Hello and good evening. I'm Hafiz Marzuki. Welcome to Consider This. This is a show where we want you to consider and then reconsider the news of the day. On tonight's show, we have a distinguished guest who actually does not need any introduction. However, I'm going to introduce him anyways. He is Professor Jeffrey Sachs. He is the President of the UN uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network or SDSN. Other than that, he is also the Tansri Jeffrey Chia uh, Honorary Distinguished Professor at Sunway University. He has also been Special Advisor to three United Nations Secretaries General. Uh, he is in town, of course, for the recent uh, ESD for 2030 Regional Meeting on Transforming the Futures of Education here at uh, Sunway University. And ESD is, of course, uh, the acronym for Education for Sustainable Development. Professor Jeffrey, thanks so much for fitting us in. Of in course, your, great very, to be with you. Great very back packed back schedule. Tail. All right, uh, uh, the first question would be, um, how, how, how do you envision uh, integrating ESD across the le learning systems in Asia? What are the key opportunities? What are the key challenges uh, in this particular region? Great. Well, first, uh, we have to uh, uh, say what is SD or sustainable development. It, it means taking a, a rounded or holistic approach to our society. We want economic development but also we want social development. We want all parts of society to, to be part of a prosperous economy. We want environmental sustainability because everybody knows we've got a climate crisis, mm -hmm. we have an ecosystem yep. crisis, we have a land use crisis, yes. we have a deforestation crisis, crisis. Everywhere. oh my God. <laughs> so sustainable development is the idea. Uh, let's look at this holistically and solve it holistically. Let's find new ways to organize the energy system or new ways to do agriculture so that we can be both prosperous and environmentally sustainable. But for that, we need skilled young people. We need uh, young leaders in their society, in new businesses, in startups, in innovation. So this is where education for sustainable development comes in because this idea sustainable development didn't even exist really 30 years ago yeah. for yeah. school systems and so the idea is we're in a new age we need new curriculum new uh, uh, programs for young people much more experiential learning because mm -hmm. i would like young people in a school to say hmm, what about our community uh, how do we go to a low carbon economy mm -hmm. uh, do we have solar panels uh, on our school what should we be doing in in the agriculture in our region, depending on where in the, in the country the young people are. So experiential, problem solving, related to the environmental, social, and economic ideas all interlinked. This is the idea of ESD. It's about exposing uh, the young people. And, and how, how do you see the, uh, the role of educators and also educational institutions in, you know, you know, uh, dishing it out or uh, delivering yeah, I, it. I was very happy at the Sunway University Conference, which was uh, uh, also partnered by UNESCO, so the UN agency. This was very wonderful. Uh, we had the Japanese government as a partner. We had uh, the organization that I lead for the UN Secretary General, the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Mm -hmm. All together, there were 30 or 40 teachers from around Malaysia. They mm -hmm. were beaming and smiling. It was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, but it means they were also there because they're committed to this new kind of instruction. My <coughs> belief is that this is not only good to empower the young people, but really good for the economy as well. Now, why is that? Because every economy is going to have to have a new energy system, mm -hmm. wind, solar, yeah. hydro, geothermal, and so forth. This is something new. Young people had better be there yeah. able to lead that kind of uh, new technology. <clears throat> we're going to have electric vehicles. We're, yeah. we're going to have uh, hydrogen-based uh, steel making. Mm -hmm. We're going to have hydrogen-based uh, shipping and so forth. We need young people with the technical skills for that. The teachers will be the ones to empower them, but they need to be trained also. We need a new curriculum. And part of sustainable development is all of the global interlinkages. You know, Malaysia's tightly linked with China in the economy, in technology, for example. But maybe in the schools, students won't understand that or mm -hmm. learn that unless that's also brought to the forefront to explain how the different parts of the world economy fit together. 
I am launching uh, my own course for high school students worldwide, freely available through the UN system to help students everywhere understand the interconnectedness mm -hmm. of the world because for them, maybe the world seems very distant and it's not relevant for yeah. them, but believe me, the interconnectedness is relevant for all of us. Yeah, can, can you share examples of like maybe um, you know, successful educational uh, policies influenced by ESG principles? I see already all over the world uh, young people who are becoming leaders in their communities in changing the energy system, uh, recycling uh, the uh, waste, reducing the pollutants, protecting the, uh, the, the biodiversity because that was their school assignment. Mm -hmm. Then they learned. Yeah. Then they said, yeah. oh, we need to do this. Then I'm watching uh, young people that became part of some of our projects 10 years ago, now they're mayors or they're, uh, they're small businesses. In influencing, uh, poli influencing policies at a higher level. You're watching this progression spread and some of the older politicians in the world never learn this stuff, but it's the <laughs> young people who are gonna transform the world. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, we, ha we have to take a look back at COVID-19 and, and it's such a significant event which actually like impacted the world. How, how, how do you see uh, it impacted educational institutions in terms of its resilience and sustainability? Well, we know it was a terrible shock uh, and um, uh, uh, it, there's a long story <laughs> with, the, with COVID also yeah. because I, I suspect it may have come out of a laboratory research uh, okay. that the U.S. was promoting, but okay. that's, that's, that's a whole that's, nother that's a, story. There's a whole nother episode. Uh, but but it, it means also we have to be very careful about the technologies we're using not to create terrible accidents. Mm. But when it comes to the school systems, suddenly all over the world schools were online. Mm. Oh my yeah. God, what do we yeah. do? Yeah. You know, and so Even kindergartens. <laughs> it was incredible, by the way. Yes, my granddaughters <laughs> suddenly were online yeah. in front of their tablets yeah. uh, in, in New York City as well. And so people found out, oh, you can teach that way. It's, we want to be face to face, but we can be blended. We can do mm -hmm. some things online. In fact, need to do some things online. We can connect classrooms around the world. We can use online materials for students uh, to learn instead of having uh, textbooks in hand. Now things can be freely available on, on the web as long as uh, uh, the, the kids have a device of some kind. And that's part of what a new uh, school design has to include. So the world transformed very fast. Of course, we also saw that learning dropped for a couple of years quite significantly yeah. because many students couldn't get online. Many yeah. students were completely marginalized. Some students had no learning for a couple of years and the costs were very, very high. As we come out of that crisis, I'm making a big case uh, as much as I can in the UN system that we need to really pour in the effort, the focus, and the financial resources to educational upgrading and upskilling. I want every young person to have a digital device of mm -hmm. some kind, a tablet or a smartphone, that they can use to augment the learning that they're going to get in the classroom. So this is part of the debates now going on at the UN in, in New York. It's part of my objective in our network to really take learning as the centerpiece for achieving sustainable development. Uh, uh, Professor, other than investing that, I mean, how else can we build back better? Is there, are there approaches or you know, systems that we need to change? How, how do we approach this particular problem as we move post-COVID? I think that one of the big challenges is that since we have to transform our society, we can't just go on with short-term change or say leave it to business mm -hmm. or maybe even a five-year plan. I'm encouraging Malaysia, but every other country to say, where should our society be economically, socially, technologically, in terms of infrastructure, uh, ecologically, at the mid-century in 2050? Well, that used to seem like a huge way off. Now mm. it's just a quarter century off. But I want governments to think ahead and discuss with the citizens, where do we want to be 25 years from now? Because 
we need to be doing things very differently from what we're doing. If we just continue and say, we want growth, we want higher income, mm -hmm. we're going to not have a rainforest left, we're yeah. not going to have a functioning ocean, our fisheries mm -hmm. will be destroyed, the climate will be so dangerous. We have to do things differently. But in order to do that, it's not enough for me to say that. Uh, it's necessary to plan for the new approach. I call it pathway mm -hmm. analysis because it's like you're trying to climb the mountain. What is the path yeah. that you're going to take? Most governments don't know. They've never had to do it before. Yeah. So I want them to plan for the future at the time scale yeah. of mid-century. Yeah, because we don't want governments to like grasp in the, in the dark of sorts. Or to say, yeah, let's try this. No, let's try yeah. this. Or here's what we'll do for the next five years, not knowing that that's kind of a dead end because we need to go that way. So that's the main point. Think ahead. Yeah. So, so maybe you can share some of the key initiatives that SDSN is doing in terms of you know, pushing for reforms or encouraging reforms worldwide. Well, one of the main ones is because of climate change. This is a fossil fuel economy in Malaysia, yes. but <laughs> fossil fuels cannot be the main primary energy source for the future. Thank goodness we have sunshine, we have wind, we have oceans, we have hydro. We have nuclear if it's used safely. We have other ways to power the economy. So one of the main programs of SDSN is what should the energy system of the world be in 2050? Well, you can't answer that as just the world. You have to answer it for Malaysia. Yeah. You have to answer it for yeah. Indonesia. You have to answer it for the Philippines. So we have an ASEAN-wide project to look at the ASEAN green future to try to understand that question. Same thing with food supply, agriculture, and protection of fisheries or the forests or the mangroves or other ecosystems. If we go on as we've been going on, we will wreck everything because the way our economy works is take over some land, build something, and then realize, oh, the forest has just gone down 20% compared to what it was a quarter century ago. We can't go on that way. So we have a major project on what is sustainable land use? What is precision agriculture? What does it mean for sustainable palm oil or sustainable uh, other crops? How can the fisheries be better, better managed? So this is another area. A third area we've already discussed, which is how to make education really work for the 21st century so that it is addressing the real issues, the skills that young people need. And that means a reform around education for sustainable development. So these are the longer term, we call them the transformations. We have six transformations we focus on. Education, health, energy, land use, urban, because most of the world will be in cities now, and uh, it will be 70 or even 80% in cities by mid-century. And the last is the digital, because we are in a digital world. I mean, all you mentioned, Prof, are real critical problems that require long-term thinking. And I, I think one of the sad things, really, are governments these days are dealing with polarization, political exactly. you know, misinformation, and etc. How do we ensure that these critical issues remain prioritized in their agenda? Yeah, if you say to a normal government, plan for 2050, they say, are you kidding? I'm trying to survive <laughs> I'm trying to win the election. <laughs> you know, exactly, or to the next election. But the truth is, the public wants real solutions. The solutions are not gimmicks. Governments that offer real solutions and guidance are the ones that inspire the public, and they actually make political success as well. So I constantly say to my own country's <laughs> governments, you're so short-sighted. They say, well, that's politics. I say, no, it's going to cost you the election because people will know you're just improvising. You're not solving problems. And President John F. Kennedy, who was a, a very inspiring president of the United States, used to say, by defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly toward it. So his idea of leadership was set the goal and show that it can be achieved. 
Mm -hmm. One of the great goals he set as president was let's go to the moon and back mm -hmm. this decade. Americans fell in love with that. I, I was a, a kid <laughs> and I loved that goal. And of yeah. course it inspired the whole country. So I think politicians can be successful if they inspire, if they say, that's where we're gonna go, mm -hmm. we can get there, this is how. Even though it's longer term, the public will say, oh, here's someone and a political party, for example, that's leading us in the right direction. Some, some, something or somewhere for us to roll together. Yeah, exactly. So another thing, uh, Prof, that, that is quite worrying that I've been reading about, you know, the United Nations latest update on progress towards meeting the SDG paints a very dire picture. Yeah. In fact, I, I believe 50% are considered as weak and another 30% have reverse installed. How, how, do we, how do we get the leaders to put us back on track when it comes to SDG agenda? So originally the goals were set in September 2015 to be achieved by 2030, so 15 year timetable. That was very ambitious. Things did not work out right. Yeah. Uh, and A lot of hiccups along the way, we more had, than hiccups. We had COVID, we had the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East, we had the US and China uh, clashing with each other. Uh, unfortunately, in my own country, very little interest in, in this. The US is influential in the world, so, uh, then governments also said, hmm, 17 goals, this is complicated. Mm -hmm. It took them a while to incorporate this. Then another thing that I think was predictable but was not predicted adequately, the poorer countries said, okay, we're in, we want to do this, uh, where's the money? And uh, the rich country, the money? Well, that's your problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and the poor country said, but we're poor, we, we, <laughs> we need, need to we invest. Need. Yeah. And that basic problem is still unsolved. And we have a major conference next year called the Financing for Development mm -hmm. Summit. It will be in Spain in the middle of the year. And I'm counting and working towards some breakthroughs there to address this money issue because that's been a big issue. So the bottom line is we're going to miss the 2030 deadline. It doesn't mean we say, well, nice try, yeah. let's do something else. It has to be we need to get refocused, we need to accelerate, we need to understand some of these goals are going to be achieved 2035, 2040, but we've got to hurry. We can't become cynical about it and say, well, you know, we didn't do our homework, or we failed. Yeah. No, the world needs to achieve these goals as fast as possible. So, so Prof, who, who can take the lead for that particular effort? Because I know it's a mammoth effort but who can take the lead? Is, is the UN still well placed to drive this forward? The UN is the place where everybody comes together. It's not the place that determines things. It's, it's the meeting grounds. I love it because 193 governments that don't necessarily get along all that well sometimes, can come, can, can they together. come together to try to agree on basic principles. This September, just in a couple of months, September 22-23, will be a rather remarkable summit meeting called the Summit of the Future. Mm -hmm. It never happened before with that title. The idea is the world leaders will come to discuss, okay, things aren't working so great. How do we make things work better? And they have decided they're gonna talk about sustainable development. They're gonna talk about how to end the wars. They're gonna talk about how to use the technologies for the good. They're gonna talk about how to improve the education systems. They're gonna talk about how to reform the United Nations. So this is very good. I'm trying to give a lot of suggestions. <laughs> how about this, how about this, how about this? But at least the world leaders will come together for this event and I think recalibrate uh, I hope take new energy and say, okay, we agree, we're going that way. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned about the interconnectedness of all these challenges and, and that, that made me think, um, how, how should governments or leaders prioritise in terms, what, what are the short term uh, issues that we need to address? What are the long term issues that we need to address? How, how, how do we contextualise that? Well, I learned uh, also through experience, because I'm trained as an economist, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a climatologist, I'm not an ecologist, I don't understand agriculture, I like food, but I don't <laughs> understand agriculture and farming. So when I became head of an institute at Columbia University, uh, now uh, uh, 
20, more than 20 years ago, actually, called the Earth Institute. Uh, the idea was, let's work on sustainable development. And there were the climate scientists, there were the ecologists, there were the engineers, and so on. Oh my God, I loved it. It was like being back in school because okay. there was someone you could ask, yeah. well, what does this really yeah. mean? I don't understand this. What about this? They did not talk so easily to each other at the beginning because it was different yeah. language. Yeah. Uh, economists have one language. Uh, yeah. the, the political scientists have another language. The engineers have another language. So we need to learn the common language of sustainable development. Here we are at Sunway University. They're championing this holistic approach. It's really wonderful. If you walk around the campus at Sunway University, you see the 17 sustainable development goals everywhere. As you go yeah. up the escalator, yeah. as, uh, as uh, you're going into the classrooms, they're everywhere. And they're, they're creating new ways for this combined holistic approach. It's a, it's a new kind of language. It's a new kind of language. And, and when, when you talk about new kind of language, and of course the youth has to take it up, how critical are the youth in terms of driving this to the next level? Because I think we've, we've, we've done a lot of efforts to get where we are, but how do we continue that efforts in you know, pushing it for the next generation? Well, there's, there's no choice. Uh, the youth are the leaders of uh, the, the coming generation. So uh, the earth is going to be in your hands, their hands. This, this is the basic point. Uh, and, uh, the job of a, an older guy like me is to help empower young people to say, here's what you're going to face. Think about mid-century because at that point you're going you're to be running a business or you're going to be in government or you're going to be a politician. Here's what we can say given where we are in 2024 and how the world's changing, where we're heading right now, and where do you want to be so that you may be raising a family then, or you may be uh, leading a business. What kind of world do you want? What kind of Malaysia do you want? What kind of ASEAN do you want? Oh, you want to be there, but society's heading mm. here. Well, how do we make that we'll curve, make for example, safer environment, or more prosperity, or better schools? And that's what I want young people to think about. What kinds of transformations should be put in place, how can they be done? Young people know the digital world better than the older people. They have lived in it entirely. How can we use these new tools to really make these changes? Thank you very much, Prof, for this very insightful uh, discussion. Well, great to be with you. Thanks yes. so much. Uh, that was Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, I'm Hafiz Mazuki, wrapping up Consider This for Tonight. That's all. Thank you.